So I'm, I'm happy to talk today on the topic of progress towards neuroprotection in Parkinson's disease. So neuroprotection in Parkinson's, why is it so difficult? That's the first thing I'm gonna talk about. And then why am I still optimistic despite the difficulties that I'm going to discuss? Uh, these are some of my disclosures. Uh, no true conflicts of interest, although I am have done consulting for BIAL, which is doing one of the studies that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, here's just a growing list of some of the famous people who reported that they have Parkinson's disease. Um, one at uh, the bottom right here is Tim Greenemeyer, who's actually a very well-known and accomplished Parkinson's researcher himself, who recently announced uh, in Science Magazine that he himself has been diagnosed with Parkinson's. You know, fortunately, uh, we have many meds that are effective to varying degrees to, in treating the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. This is this is a, a pretty long list. It used to be just carbidopa, levodopa. Now we have all of these meds. And of course, the list would be dramatically longer if I included other medications for treating other symptoms, non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's. However, all of these meds only treat the symptoms. None actually have been proven to slow progression of Parkinson's. And what I mean by slowing progression compared to just treating the symptoms, you can see here, which is, um, this is a, a diagram of the midbrain, the, the deeper part of your brain. And you see this dark substance on both sides, which is uh, neuromelanin, a pigment like in the skin, uh, but in this case in the brain, produced by the same neurons that make dopamine. And as you see on the right hand, most of those pigmented neurons are missing. And that's representative of a person with Parkinson's after many years, most of those dopamine producing neurons are lost. So when we talk about neuroprotection, we mean not just compensating for the loss of dopamine, but actually trying to block the progression from having these neurons to losing the neurons. So that's what we're trying to do, slow the progression. Fortunately, there's a lot in the pipeline. Uh, this is a, a wonderful review article by Kevin McFarthing, which he and his colleagues have been updating each year, showing a list of let me just move to a higher one, of uh, larger, although it's still small print here, of all the disease-modifying therapies, meaning therapies aimed at slowing progression on the bottom half, symptomatic therapies. And there are more symptomatic therapies than disease-modifying therapies, but plenty of drugs aimed at slowing progression under investigation. I'm obviously not going to be able to talk about all of it, but we'll discuss just a couple of examples here today. Unfortunately, many uh, drugs that have been tried. In fact, every drug that already has, well, almost every drug, we'll, we'll come back to that, that has been tried so far has failed. So this is a slide uh, modified from Alberto Espe, a colleague of mine who has the graveyard of all the drugs that have been tried in, to see if they might slow progression in clinical trials, but failed to do it. Here's the drugs in the cradle that have been, uh, are still in the works, except a couple of these that I'm not going to talk about today. Isoratapine and inosine have subsequently shown negative results in clinical trials. They don't work. I'm not gonna talk about those today, but I wanna talk about one other one, nilotinib, as one example of a drug that went into phase two placebo-controlled clinical trials. Nilotinib is an example of a repurposed drug. It was already approved for a, a blood cancer called CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia. And it had some effects that were felt potentially could be beneficial in people with Parkinson's. Alpha-synuclein is a protein that builds up in the brain in people with Parkinson's and contributes to the loss of those dopamine neurons. Turns out nilotinib affects pathways that promote clearance of that protein. So it was thought it might be helpful. And it was tested in animal models of Parkinson's, you know, mice that are uh, treated in ways that lead to the loss of their dopaminergic neurons and nilotinib can block it. Although keep in mind that the, the animal models they used were not great. They were acute toxin models where you treat with in this case, a drug called MPTP that very rapidly kills off the dopaminergic neurons. So that's not really a good model of what happens in people with Parkinson's where uh, the problem occurs slowly over years or even decades. So, um, so, you know, this may not be the best model to use to try to predict what will work in people. However, in a phase one open label study in just a small number of patients, nilotinib was tried and it got a lot of press report because it looked like it had a huge symptomatic effect. 
Um, you saw reports like these quotes I've listed here. I'll just read the bottom one. The research search say the first time a therapy appears to reverse cognitive and motor decline. And you see here's a quote from a, from a patient. Sounds like it had dramatic effects. The problem is, again, this was phase one open label. Open label studies are not, in this case, it was not designed to affect, assess efficacy and placebo effect is very strong in people with Parkinson's. You know, over and over we see where people see what they think are dramatic effects that couldn't possibly be just placebo, but it turns out it is. So you really can't draw any conclusions about efficacy. Also, remember the goal here was just trying to slow progression. It wasn't predicted to have any immediate effects on reversing symptoms. So there's a lot questionable there. Nonetheless, it went on to two phase two controlled clinical studies. Here's just a little bit of the information about those two studies. They were very similar in 75 moderate Parkinson's patients randomized to nilotinib or placebo and then followed over a year where they used clinical measures to measure progression and see if nilotinib slowed progression compared to placebo. And first of all, the results showed for the group in Georgetown, their study, uh, compared to the one actually that I was involved in on the steering committee uh, funded by the Michael J. Fox Foundation, the NILO PD study, both showed no significant clinical benefits, did not slow progression. The other interesting thing is that dramatic placebo effect we saw in the open label studies was not seen here. The placebo effect itself was much less and the drug did no better than placebo. Um, now there's reasons for that. It turns out nilotinib, although it affects a mechanism that may be relevant, it doesn't get into the brain very well. So we really haven't tested this mechanism adequately and might try other drugs that have a similar mechanism, but get into the brain better. Those are still worth testing in the future. Um, you know, although the Georgetown group still thought maybe this might be worth pursuing, the steering committee that I was part of on the Michael J. Fox Foundation funded study unanimously thought this was not promising and nilotinib should not be pursued further. So my, in my view, nilotinib now gets added to the graveyard. But what about uh, another more recent study on deferoprone? Deferoprone is an iron chelator. Uh, it helps remove iron from the brain. And there's some idea that iron accumulation in the brain may contribute to, <clears throat> excuse me, to progression in Parkinson's. So, uh, and, and also deferoprone did show some potential benefits in animal models of Parkinson's, excuse me. So <clears throat> a phase two randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial was done. Double-blind meaning the patients didn't know which they were getting and the Physicians who were assessing them clinically didn't know what they were getting. And they were treated with deferoprone or placebo for 36 weeks and the rate of progression measured by our clinical scales was assessed. And here are the results. And the interesting thing is, this did show a statistically significant difference between the drug and placebo at 36 weeks. The problem, the deferoprone group did worse than the placebo group. Now that is not what we were looking for. So. I'm afraid deferoprone now needs to move it to the graveyard. However, I have to qualify that because there's some idea why the mechanism of deferoprone may have had actually a negative symptomatic effect, mainly because iron is needed in the process of synthesizing dopamine. So it may have caused a temporary reduction in dopamine that caused negative symptomatic effects, even though it's still possible it slowed progression. So there may still be some interest in pursuing this mechanism, but at least based on this study alone, it didn't work. But we'll, there may be more to hear in the future. So these are just a couple of examples, but you've seen from the graveyard slide that there's a lot of trials that have failed. So these are all agents that were felt to have promise based on theory and preclinical models, yet none of them showed benefits, at least not proven to show benefits in clinical studies. Why is it so difficult to move from animals to humans? I have just a few, few thoughts on that. One is that um, Parkinson's is heterogeneous, meaning the causes of Parkinson's are, first of all, it's very, very different clinically from one person to another. The rate of progression varies, the pr which symptoms predominate vary. So it makes it hard to measure progression or to predict progression. The other problem is there's not usually a single cause in each patient. There's usually multiple causes, both genetic and environmental. And the 
set of causes that contributes to Parkinson's and progression in one patient may be very different from another. So it's hard to find one mechanism to target that would work for everybody. And so basically we're taking a group of people that are very different from one to another, even though they all have Parkinson's and treating them as if they're all the same when we enroll them in a clinical trial. There may be better ways to do that, to find subgroups of patients who might be more likely to respond to your particular treatment. And we'll come back to that. So, but that's the need to identify subgroups of Parkinson's. Uh, inaccurate diagnosis, not everybody we think has Parkinson's truly does. That's especially a problem early in Parkinson's, which is an issue because most of the clinical trials try to enroll people at early stages. And then um, we need better diagnostic and progression biomarkers. Right now, when we measure progression, we assess people clinically and try to decide how far they progress, but our clinical measurements are very you know, inaccurate. You know, There's a lot of noise there, and there's a lot of reasons why people's symptoms may vary day to day or hour to hour, and we try to address that as best we can, but it would be nice to have better progression biomarkers. With that in mind, there was just a few months ago this uh, uh, news that got a lot of attention from a, a biomarker, again, supported by the Michael J. Fox Foundation, which is called the alpha-synuclein seeding assay. Remember, alpha-synuclein is that protein that builds up in the brain of people with Parkinson's. And they found a way to assess pathologic, meaning abnormal forms of alpha-synuclein in the spinal fluid. Um, that's where you do a lumbar puncture, a spinal tap, and get a little sample of spinal fluid, and then test the propensity of the alpha-synuclein to cause uh, propagation of an abnormal conformation in other alpha-synuclein molecules. That's why it's called a seeding assay. And this assay is, has fairly high sensitivity and specificity for Parkinson's. And if, in theory, it also might be useful as a biomarker for strategies aimed at reducing alpha-synuclein. Maybe we can see if it targets this biomarker in the spinal fluid to tell us if a given agent is worthwhile for moving forward in clinical trials. So this hasn't been used in prior clinical trials because it's relatively new, but it might be very helpful for future trials, also maybe even clinically for helping with the diagnosis and um, progression markers. So Another problem, you know, we need to start treatment very early because by the time people are diagnosed, a, a significant number of those dopamine producing neurons already are lost. Um, another problem is it's difficult to distinguish between, between symptomatic or neuroprotective effects. So if you start a drug versus placebo and look after a while, if a drug, if the people on the drug are better than the placebo people, that doesn't automatically mean it slowed progression. For instance, carbidopa levodopa will do that because it treats the symptoms. So you have to have strategies to uh, distinguish between symptomatic effects versus truly slowing progression. And there's various ways we can do that. Um, this, this is back to what I mentioned. We can't, you know, knowing if it really slowed progression, ideally we'd count the neurons but we can't do that in people. So we have to have surrogate measures. Um, you know, there's also difficulties in clinical trials. It's, you know, often sometimes it's difficult to find enough patients who are eligible and able to participate. They're very expensive. And again, I mentioned the animal models. There's limitations of the animal models. We often use mouse models, but you know, the, the mouse brain is not the same as a human brain. Here you can see a, a typical human brain weighs about 1,500 grams. A mouse brain weighs about 0 0.4 grams, less than one gram. And we're trying to see what protects in this little tiny mouse brain to predict what will protect in the large human brain. Now still, there's there are remarkable similarities even between a mouse brain and a human brain. And I think there is value, but we have to recognize these Mice don't get Parkinson's. They're mouse models of Parkinson's, and they aren't always predictive, though we are getting better at our mouse models. For example, instead of the acute toxin models I mentioned, we now have mice that express increased amounts of that protein alpha-synuclein and develop a very slow degeneration over many months or a year or more. And so that's closer to what happens in Parkinson's, although, of course, experiments in those kind of mice take a lot longer because you have to wait many months or a year to see the effect in your mice. So another big problem is there's so many potentially promising agents or theoretically promising agents that we can't possibly test them all. How do we know which are really the best to move forward in clinical trials? 
Well, I, I'm very proud to be on this uh, excellent committee run by the Cure Parkinson uh, uh, Foundation, or Cure Parkinson's Trust. Now they just call themselves Cure Parkinson. And this is a committee of people who have various expertises. They're uh, in research and clinical care of people with Parkinson's. And we each year meet and assess you know, maybe 16 to 20 different agents that seem promising. And we read all about the pros and cons in terms of preclinical and clinical data that are available and decide which look really promising and are ready to move forward in clinical trials in Parkinson's. And it's been really interesting uh, and educational to be part of this committee. Um, so coming back to why is this so difficult to do and why am I still optimistic? I wanna move on to a, some more recent clinical trials that haven't been negative and that are still in that very promising cradle phase and maybe even getting closer to success. One is exenatide. And what you see here on the left is a picture of the Gila monster because exenatide is actually an FDA approved drug for treating diabetes. It helps improve insulin resistance. And it was discovered from studies of the saliva of the Gila monster. I, I always wonder why anybody was studying the saliva of the Gila monster, but uh, it, it was successful that they did. And uh, this is a class of drugs called a GLP-1 agonist. And the reason I mentioned that name is because several drugs with that same mechanism now look promising for treating Parkinson's. Exenatide is a once per week injection and it protects in mouse models of Parkinson's. I'm not gonna go over that data. It was prioritized by that linked clinical trials committee that I mentioned and now has moved on. Actually, I'm gonna show you data from a double blind placebo controlled phase two study. And in this study, which was published a few years ago, the 62 people were randomized to exenatide or placebo and treated for 48 weeks. And then to try to distinguish if it was a symptomatic versus uh, neuroprotective effect, they did a 12 week washout, meaning they everybody stopped the drug they were taking and they looked after 12 weeks because if it was symptomatic, maybe the benefits would be lost. But if you actually slowed progression, then the exenatide group might still be better than the placebo group even after the 12 weeks without the drug. And they used clinical measures of progression as we typically do. They did it in the off state, meaning people, um, some of the people in these trials or, or the people in the trials already were on Parkinson's medications, but they didn't take them overnight before the morning assessments the next day to try to minimize masking of the clinical status um, from the drugs. And the result was that scores over that period improved by one point on our clinical scales in the exenatide group compared to worsening over that period by 2.1 points in the placebo group. Sounds good. And here's where you can see the data. Compared to baseline, the exenatide group, sorry, the, the placebo group got gradually worse, but the exenatide group was better. And at the end of even the washout period, the exenatide group still was significantly better than, than the placebo group. However, and by the way, I should say on this score, lower scores are better, which is why the placebo group is lower than the exenatide group, lower meaning better. However, if you look at not change from baseline, but just what their scores actually were, you see at baseline, that's this, these dots at the zero time point, the exenatide group was worse than the placebo group. Now that shouldn't happen because this was a randomized study, but just by bad luck, it happened that more of the more severely affected people were randomized to the exenatide group. So that calls a little bit into question well, how to interpret this because some of this could be what's called regression to the mean where you catch people at a bad time and they're more likely better the next time you see them. And some of this could be uh, a symptomatic effect where you see a, a big effect in the first a uh, few weeks. So we really don't know if this was neuroprotection or a symptomatic effect or just chance. However, there also was an imaging component to this study, something called a DAT scan, which is a way to measure dopamine uptake in a region of the brain. And usually with people with Parkinson's, you have reduced dopamine uptake that gets a little bit worse over time. In the exenatide group, that worsening over time was less compared to the worsening over time in the uh, placebo group. Now, this would not be subject to placebo effect. This is an objective measure of dopamine uptake. So this is encouraging. Now, one problem is we don't really know for sure how to interpret DAT scans, but to the extent that this might represent slowing of progression, this is really encouraging. And for that reason, 
we this is now in a phase three study where they're studying people on exenatide versus placebo with a larger number of patients over two years. This is being done in the UK now, and we should be hearing results of that um, soon, uh, hopefully by next year. Um, another GLP-1 agonist uh, called lixacenatide was studied and recently reported just last month in the uh, in uh, uh, from results from a phase two placebo-controlled trial, one year in 156 with people with Parkinson's. Again, this is another GLP-1 agonist that also we think might promote clearance of alpha-synuclein. And in this case, we we don't it hasn't been published yet, so we don't have the peer-reviewed data, but it's been uh, uh, the results have been announced publicly, and it was positive for the primary outcome measure, meaning by the clinical measures they used to assess progression, people treated with lixacenatide progressed more slowly than people treated with placebo. That looks really encouraging, but we've only seen the preliminary results presented at a meeting, and we need to see the more detailed results in a peer-reviewed publication, which I hope we'll be seeing soon, and then we can assess the validity, validity of this result. But certainly looks promising, um, and you know, if given this result, and then we'll see what the exenatide result shows as well, this might be a class of drugs that ultimately could be used to slow progression in people with Parkinson's. But, but you know, don't recommend taking it yet. We don't know yet. It's looking promising, but we haven't confirmed it yet. So back to the question of people with Parkinson's aren't all the same and how do we subgroup them? One way that I think is really useful to subtype people with Parkinson's based on a mechanism that we can have high confidence is relevant to the progression is by genetic subtypes. So there are many genes that have been associated with Parkinson's. The most common is a, a mu mutations in a gene called the GBA1 gene. Maybe 10% roughly of people with Parkinson's have a mutation in this gene. The effect of the gene varies depending on which mutation, but common ones might cause about a four to five fold increased risk of Parkinson's. So still not everybody who gets a GBA mutation will ever get Parkinson's, but the risk is increased. And mutations cause low activity of the enzyme. So in this case, as you could imagine, uh, we could design drugs or strategies that would increase activity of that enzyme. And those might be particularly promising for the subtype of people with Parkinson's who also have a GBA mutation. Another example are mutations in a gene called LARC2, L-R-R-K2. This is much less common, one or 2% of all people with Parkinson's. So it's, but still that's the second most common of the genetic factors that we typically discuss for people with Parkinson's. It is also incompletely penetrant, maybe 25 to 50% lifetime risk of getting Parkinson's if you have a LARC2 mutation. In this case, oddly enough, the mutations cause high activity of the enzyme. And so uh, in that case, one could imagine finding strategies to inhibit the enzyme might be protective. And I'm going to come back to examples of both of those. And there are many, several other genetic factors, uh, each of which could be potentially targeted. I will talk a little bit about targeting alpha-synuclein directly. Um, there's a lot of interesting research on the others as well that I, I won't have time to talk about today. So Embroxol is an example of an agent that was found in a large screen of looking for drugs by, this was by Tony Shapira and colleagues, where they were looking for drugs that could increase activity of the, of the enzyme encoded by the GBA gene. And they found that Broxol, a, a mucolytic that is commonly used clinically, could actually do that. So it went into uh, early phase trials. And here we're talking about a non-randomized, non-controlled trial in 17 patients. And then interestingly, they checked patients with GBA mutations and also patients without GBA mutations even though it looks most promising, as you'd imagine, to treat people with GBA mutations who we know have low enzyme activity, a subset of people even who don't have GBA mutations also have low activity of the, G of the same enzyme encoded by the GBA gene. In that case, not due to a mutation in the gene, we don't always know why they have low activity, but it makes sense that you know, the people with the mutations may be telling us a clue as to a strategy that might even work in people who don't have the mutations. So they're testing it in both. Their initial 
study wasn't designed to tell if it can slow progression. You can't possibly do that with only 17 patients, but it did show that they could significantly increase the levels of this G of the enzyme activity in spinal fluid. They saw some improvement in modiohira scores, but again, like with nilotinib, this was open label. People knew they were getting the drug. There was no placebo in this study, so that doesn't mean much. And as we, as we mentioned, we weren't really expecting it to to treat the symptoms. But still, this was promising. It looked well tolerated. It, engage the target based on the protein in the CSF. So it's now in a phase three study, a much larger number of people with Parkinson's being treated for two years with Ambroxol or placebo. And, um, you know, we look forward to hearing those results, though we're, we're still away, a while away before we'll hear that. Um, so this could be an example of precision medicine, especially if it turns out to work spe specifically in people with the mutations compared to people without the mutations. Although it would be even better if it turns out to work in all people, we'll see. Another study, and this is the one that I consulted with Bial and helped to design, is called the Activate Study. Bial is a company that developed a small molecule. This is not a repurposed drug, but a new molecule that can increase GK's activity, and it um, can you know, double or triple GK's activity. And this molecule, based on the preclinical and early, mainly the preclinical data, was prior, also prioritized by the ILCT committee for moving forward in clinical trials. And right now, there's a phase two placebo-controlled clinical trial underway. It will include over 200 patients with Parkinson's who also have a GBA mutation. Um, we're going to be a site for that study. We hope to be activated any day now. Um, and um, if anybody, even if you don't have a GBA mutation, if you're, or if you don't know if you have one, you can enter the study and get free genetic testing for whether or not you have a GBA or LARC2 mutation. And then if you do, you'd potentially be eligible to move forward. Um, people who wanna get tested independent of, of this study uh, have the option of getting free genetic testing through the Parkinson's Foundation's PD generation program, which itself is also a study because the Parkinson's Foundation is trying to learn about the genetics of Parkinson's through patient participation. It, you can give either a blood sample or a cheek swab and they do comprehensive testing of all seven of those genes that I listed before, GBA, LARC2, alpha-synuclein, Parkin, PINK1, DJ1, and VPS35. And they do good quality, uh, and comprehensive analysis of the genes and give you a report together with clinical genetic counseling about whether or not you have any of these mutations. If you have a GBA mutation, the one that's the most common, then if you're interested, you could learn more about possibly participating in that, um, that study uh, that I mentioned on a GK, uh, an enzyme activator, um, though it's optional. And of course, not everybody who participates in PD generation will be eligible. Um, LARC2 would be the second most common. And let me talk a little bit about the, the trials targeting LARC2. So as I mentioned, here's just an example showing the enzyme activity of LARC2. It's called kinase activity, which is just uh, a form of phosphorylating other proteins, a chemical modification. And you see, if you call 100% the level of activity of the wild type LARC2 gene product, when you have the mutation, it's dramatically higher activity. So uh, uh, some companies, including a, a, a collaboration between Denali and Biogen, have developed a small molecule that can inhibit the LARC2 activity. And they, are, they initially started two phase two clinical studies to try to test this inhibitor in people with Parkinson's. One was precision medicine, testing it only in people with Parkinson's who have a LARC2 mutation. The other, sort of like with the GBA and Broxel study I mentioned, they wondered maybe this is a clue that lowering LARC2 activity might be beneficial even in people who don't have a LARC2 mutation. So they started a second study for that. Now, unfortunately, people with, well, I shouldn't say unfortunately, uh, an interesting uh, phenomenon is that people with LARC2 mutations actually progress slower than people who don't have LARC2 mutations, which is interesting and a potential concern actually because you know, we, the factors that cause onset of the disease, meaning increased risk, like a LARC2 mutation, may not be the same as factors that promote progression. So it's a little hard to know what this means, that having a mutation increases your risk of the disease, but is associated with slower progression. However, we know in the animal models, LARC2 inhibition 
is neuroprotective. And that's why we still think this is worth pursuing in clinical trials. But it makes it difficult in a clinical trial to see if you've slowed progression. Since it's already pretty slow, means you have to follow more patients for a longer time. And because LARC2 mutations are so rare, only you know, one to 2% of all patients are eligible, it's very difficult to recruit LARC2 positive patients with Parkinson's. So although they initiated this study in people with LARC2, they decided it was going to be, well, they didn't say why, but I suspect they decided that because it was going to be so difficult and take so many years to find enough patients to do this study, they actually decided to end the study specifically in people with LARC2 mutations. But they are continuing to study it in, in a more broad population of people with Parkinson's to see if inhibiting LARC2 might help anybody with Parkinson's, even if you don't have a LARC2 mutation. Next, I want to talk a little bit about strategies to target alpha-synuclein. That's that protein that builds up in the brains in people with Parkinson's. And when it forms clusters of that abnormal protein, that's what, what, what a key component of what's called Lewy bodies. Uh, that form within the neurons, the dopamine-producing neurons that ultimately degenerate. And we have good reason to think that this alpha-synuclein is actually contributing to neuronal death. And therefore, removing the alpha-synuclein might be protective. And how can you do that? Well, immunotherapy against alpha-synuclein. One way is an active vaccine. You actually trigger through a vaccination your own immune system to produce antibodies to attack and remove the alpha-synuclein. That looks really promising in the sense that, you know, if that works, it's very easy to scale up to the massive numbers of people who would want to get this vaccination if you're proven to work. On the downside, once you give the injection for the vaccination, you don't control how much or what type of antibodies are produced, and it'll be different from one person to, an, to the next. So an alternative is called passive immunotherapy. This is where you make the antibodies in a dish and then you infuse them into the patient. And that has the advantage that now you know exactly the concentration and type of antibodies that you're giving the patient. So the dose can be controlled and it's the same from one person to the next. The downside is it requires a monthly IV infusion and it's much more expensive. So, you know, I hope both work, though it'll be especially great if the active vaccination works. But really, so far, we've got some interesting data presented recently on the passive immunotherapy. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just going to skip over this because this talks about the pros and cons I just mentioned. So I was involved in the SPARC study. I was on the steering committee for this Biogen study looking at um, passive immunos immunization against alpha-synuclein. And unfortunately, here you can see a press release uh, from a couple of years ago showing that it failed to meet primary and even the secondary endpoints didn't look so good. It didn't work. Now, one problem is we don't have a good way yet to measure alpha-synuclein levels in the brain. So we couldn't prove whether or not this strategy actually removed alpha-synuclein in the brain of people with Parkinson's. It did in animal models, but we don't know if it did in the Parkinson's, but we know it didn't help clinically during this study. There was a second phase two study of a different antibody that targeted a different region of the alpha-synuclein molecule. And this one, if you just look at the primary report, was listed as negative. This is showing progression over time. The blue is placebo. The red is the people who got the antibodies. And remember, lower scores on this clinical measure are better. So there was a trend towards people at the end doing better who were treated with the drug than placebo, but it was not significantly different. However, it's also pretty noisy because again, these are these clinical measures that aren't great measures of progression. In this study, they had another way that they tried to measure progression with wearable accelerometers that could measure things like tremor amplitude and frequency and gait speed. And they had uh, phone apps with things like tapping to measure how rapidly people could tap, assessment of slowness or bradykinesia, and it could do that much more frequently and objectively. And if you look at the rate of progression with these uh, wearables and phone apps, you see this uh, faster slope, faster progression in placebo compared to the slower slope, uh, significantly slower and consistently slower in people on the drug. So that looks encouraging, like it really did slow progression. The problem is these wearables and apps have not yet been validated and aren't accepted by the FDA as a primary outcome measure. So though it looks encouraging, it doesn't prove it slowed progression. 
But thankfully, because of this encouraging data, as well as other secondary outcome measures that looked promising, Roche is now proceeding with an additional phase two trial. This one was called Pasadena. The, next, the one that's now ongoing is called Padova. And we so stay tuned. We're going to learn more about whether or not these antibody infusions actually slow progression. So coming back to this slide, there's a lot that looks promising in the pipeline. Uh, these are the drugs that already are in clinical trials. I just want to say a word about even earlier phase where there's a lot up and coming that looks promising. As a, and as one example, I'm going to use a, a paper that was just published last week from my own lab in Nature Communications. Um, we studied a molecule called USP30. Um, this targets a mechanism that's relevant based on two of the other genetic causes of Parkinson's, I didn't have time to talk about Parkin and PINK1 mutations that affect control of the energy metabolism in the cells. And this USP30 kind of counteracts those effects. So uh, a, a group at Mission Therapeutics developed a small molecule that inhibits USP30. And we also worked with Dr. Gabby Belmas, who developed a mouse genetically manipulated, so it lacks USP30. And whether you look at the genetic knockout or the pharma drug that inhibits USP30, both showed dramatic neuroprotection in this mouse model of Parkinson's. Now, we didn't, you know, I, I, here's an example of one of the headline news stories that came out a, a few days ago. So it's getting a lot of attention. I, I'm a little concerned that some of it might be a little sensationalized because, again, the mice don't have Parkinson's. It looks very promising and we're very encouraged by these data but we don't yet know whether or not it slows progression in people with Parkinson's. And we've seen examples before where drugs that worked in animal models didn't work in people with Parkinson's. But in this case, the animal model we used was one of the very slowly progression, progressing uh, my, mouse models that express too much alpha-synuclein. So we hope this will be more predictive of what works in people but that remains to be seen. Thankfully, this will be moving forward into clinical trials with which Mission Therapeutics is gonna be hoping to start next year. So, you know, why am I optimistic? I, I love this quote from Nelson Mandela. It, it's relevant here, it's relevant in a lot of situations in life. Um, I never lose, I either win or learn. And that's what I think has been going on with these clinical trials. So why still optimistic with one after another trial that? Uh, proved negative? Well, several reasons. One reason, we are now learning more about the true underlying causes of Parkinson's and are getting better at targeting those key mechanisms. In some cases, we're using precision medicine where we target specific subtypes of people with Parkinson's. For example, GBA, people with Parkinson's who have GBA mutations who might be especially likely to benefit from a drug that increases GBA activity. Better biomarkers. I use that example of the alpha-synuclein seeding assay that looks particularly good as a biomarker for Parkinson's, both diagnostically and maybe progression. Um, and there are other, there's other work going on to try to be able to image alpha-synuclein levels in the brain. Um, but we're, we're not there yet, but we're getting better at the biomarkers that will help us to conduct these trials. And then probably most importantly, I gave you some examples from exenatide, lixacenatide, and presunizumab, the antibodies against alpha-synuclein, that show significantly promising results in these early phase clinical studies or phase two clinical studies. So these are moving forward. Um, hopefully, uh, with the subsequent studies, we'll be able to prove that they actually slow progression. We don't know yet, so it's too early to start trying to be treated with these outside of the study but I'm still optimistic because of these and the many other drugs we saw in clinical trials and targets like USP30 that are look very promising that are about to move into clinical trials. So here's one of my favorite car side, far side cartoons, Great Moments in Evolution. Um, and I just consider it a, a slight modification of this uh, cartoon. Uh, I think this represents, uh, the baseball represents neuroprotection and Parkinson's and we're, we're very close and we're gonna be there soon. So I'm gonna stop there. I think we do have a few minutes for questions. The placebo effect is strong in people with Parkinson's. Might training and visualization using all medical information available be effective along with other traditional treatments? Yeah, you know, one interesting thing, placebo effect in a clinical trial is a problem. It makes it difficult to tell what's the true biological effect of the drug. But in clinical practice, 
placebo effect is not bad, right? Placebo effect really just means essentially using the power of your mind to do better. You know, meditation might be an example of that. And I, uh, and and so you know, if you can use your own mind in various ways to help you do better, that's great in 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 practice. In clinical trials, though, we want to see if a drug does more than just the placebo effect. So it's a problem. Another study question, are there any gene therapies available if you do test positive for these gene mutations? Well, there are in some cases people trying gene therapy strategies, including one company that's doing that for the people with GBA mutations. Um, I don't know where they stand now clinically on those trials, but um, you know, I, I do think because gene therapy at least currently requires surgery to inject the virus to carry the gene into the brain, um, it would be much better if it turns out the small molecules work, but gene therapy also is being pursued. And there also are strategies to try to allow IV infusions and get it into the brain anyway, which would be an easier way to do in gene therapy. But uh, I think we're further along with the small molecule therapies. Um, another question, do these passive vaccine molecules get through the blood-brain barrier? Really important question because, you know, the Antibodies are proteins and not all proteins can get into the brain. There's a blood brain barrier that blocks entry of some, some agents into the brain. Um, and, um, but the answer is yes, they seem to get in in sufficient quantities, at least in the animal models. So they really clear away alpha synuclein. Again, we don't have ways to test alpha synuclein in the brain and human patients to prove that they're getting in adequately to slow progression, that you can measure them in. Uh, in uh, spinal fluid to show they're getting into the brain. Um, uh, one question, how long from phase three to commercialization? You know, that's highly variable. It, you know, it depends if a phase three study looks good, it's possible sometimes even with a large phase two, if it looks especially good, that people could go to the people, meaning companies can go to the FDA and try to get approval based on even a single clinical study. But more typically, the FDA requires two successful studies to approve a drug. There's been some exceptions recently. So, um, so, and then, you know, once it's approved, it depends on manufacturing and other issues, but maybe within a few months it would get, a, get uh, be available. But again, if the FDA decides, no, that study wasn't adequate, you need to do another study, then it could be years. Um, so is there a reason to stop resagiline? Somebody's asking if I'm already on it. Um, well, that's sort of a personal question. You have to talk to your neurologist about that. I didn't talk about it today, but there are some data suggesting that resagiline might slow progression, but the clinical trials looking at that, you know, like all trials had limitations and they were not definitive. And the FDA looked at it, actually our, our own Dr. Sam Frank was part of a panel that looked at this and felt that the data were too limited and non-definitive and it was not appropriate to approve Resagiline for the purpose of slowing progression, though it is approved for symptomatic therapies. What other questions can I get to? Um, you know, what is the difference between Lewy body and Parkinson's? Uh, Lewy body dementia is really just a subtype of Parkinson's where cognitive deficits are prominent and very early, but really it's just a subtype of Parkinson's disease. Um, so, uh, you know, somebody is asking, what can we do to increase GBA testing? Well, I think the Parkinson's Foundation is doing a great job of offering, of lowering the barrier for not just GBA, but many different genes associated with Parkinson's by offering free genetic testing through the PD generation study. Again, I think uh, hopefully Hannah or Jackie put in the chat a link where you can get more information about PD generation, or you can email one of us or look on our website to learn more. Um, Couple of couple of questions in the chat have asked about the Stanford vibration therapy. You know that therapy, first of all, is not likely to slow progression. There were some reports of potential symptomatic effects, but remember how strong the placebo effect is. We don't really know if the reported benefits are more than placebo or not. It might be, but that requires further study. It's not the evidence on the vibration, vibrating gloves are not yet to a level where I would recommend people using that strategy, though it is something that could be studied further. I don't know what the status is. I know the clinical trial that was going on at Stanford on clinicaltrials.gov that lists the trials has listed it as terminated. 